loaded for high noon. That's right. Ryan, just another way to spell yard. Yeah. Now, it's St. Louis and Atlanta in game one of the National League Championship Series on Fox. On a crisp, gorgeous night in Dixie, Atlanta's chop shop is again open and ready to rock and roll tonight. Bobby Cox and the Atlanta Braves continue their world championship defense as they face Tony La Russa's tradition-rich St. Louis Cardinals in a rematch of their 1982 NLCS matchup. And hello again, everybody. I'm Chip Carey. Welcome to Atlanta and Fox Sports coverage of the 1996 National League Championship Series. It's baseball's oldest adage that good pitching gets out good hitting. That will be tested in this seven-game series as sluggers Ron Gant and Ray Lankford lead the Cardinals' opportunistic offense against Atlanta's mound masters. The Braves won nine of 13 regular season matchups between these two ball clubs, but the Cardinals won four of seven right here in Atlanta and would like nothing better than to dethrone America's team. And tonight, the Cardinals' future Hall of Famer, Ozzie Smith, plays in his final league championship series. Earlier, he chatted with Dave Winfield, and Ozzie Smith knows what the Cardinals' task is starting tonight. Ozzie, last year of a glorious career in St. Louis. Here you are starting the National League Championship game. What emotions are within you? Well, you know, it's very tough to put into words the emotion that I feel, you know, but I think it's going to be very tough to get more emotional than uh, September 28th when they retired my jersey and they had 52,000 people there in the stands. Um, you know, three days after I made the announcement, it, the, the place was sold out. So that's the highest compliment a player can be paid. And uh, it, it's always exciting getting into postseason play, and I'm looking forward to uh, having the opportunity to play in postseason again. Well, this game, I see it as a matchup of a veteran team that's won recently and a team of veterans who won throughout their career. How do you guys approach the Braves tonight? Very simple. You know, um, it's to do the things that we've done to get to this point, you know, and uh, that's execution. And I think that's a very important part of what we've done all year. Is we've executed, and it's what has allowed us to get to this point. Uh, of course, I think that with the Braves, they're here because they've been able to execute not only this year but over the last five years and uh, uh, we have a lot of young players who haven't experienced it before but I think as a veteran player it's important for us to try and make sure that they understand that they can't go out there and burden the whole load that uh, it's a team effort and everybody has to contribute. All right Tommy to me when you're on the mound you are the picture of determination. Does this ball club have that same determination, given that you've been here five times in a row and you've won a championship? I think we do. Uh, you know, the pressure's a little bit different trying to defend your championship than it was trying to get that first one. I think we're a little bit more relaxed, uh, but the pressure is still there. And uh, we have the intensity, we have the desire to win again. We want to get back to the World Series and defend our championship. So uh, we're going out there playing hard and trying to make that happen. Now, St. Louis, you come into this series, they have some guys that are pretty pesky, they have some good team speed, they have guys that can hit the ball out of the park, a lot of different things to worry about. How do you approach that? Well, I think the big thing as a pitcher you want to do is, is not help them any by walking guys. Uh, you know, you try and eliminate their speed factor a little bit by not walking guys, making them hit their way on base, because like you said, they have guys that can take you out of the ballpark. Uh, so the, the really the only way you can, can kind of neutralize any part of their game is to try and, like I say, make them hit their way on and not help them out any by walking guys. All right, Chip Carey joined with Dave Winfield and Steve Lyons. Game one of the NLCS. And Steve, the Cardinals come in a little bit banged up. Gary Gaetti will start, will play tonight. His ankle's still bothering him. Lankford and Gant with shoulder problems. The big problem for St. Louis has been scoring runs against this Braves pitching staff. Well, in order for them to have any chance in this series, they're going to have to utilize their team speed. They have some guys in this ball club that can steal a base for you. Lankford, Clayton, and, and Jordan. Even Gant has stolen some bases here in the playoffs. They've got to try to force the issue, make the Braves force them to make some mistakes. And the biggest problem that they're going to face, as we all know, can't they cannot steal, steal first base. base. Right. Gentlemen, gentlemen, John Smoltz and company should not change a thing. Basically, St. Louis is used to scoring three and a half runs per game, and they are down to about 3.1 when facing the Braves. Also, their batting average drops 40 points down to about 227. And on the other hand, Atlanta scores runs from 3.9 up to four and a half runs per game. Yeah, these teams have played some tight ball games this year. Another great stat to look at. Six times this year, the Atlanta pitching staff has held the Cardinals to two runs or fewer in a ball game. The Braves have won all six of those games, Steve. So do you play for a run early in this game and let the bullpens battle it out? I think in the National League, this is the National League playoff series. This is what happens here. You can play for one run. It's not the American League. You don't have the big bombers. 
They have the staff that can handle that. They have great bullpen, and they have two managers in this series that are also can handle that kind of pressure. I see a lot of one-run games. Well, a great pitching matchup tonight. A little history as well. For the second time in National League history, the top two pitchers will face each other. Andy Bennis goes for the Cardinals. John Smoltz goes for the Braves. Last time that happened, 1969, here in Atlanta, Tom Seaver against Phil Micro. We'll check out what else is happening in the ALCS as we continue with more controversy in the Bronx. Baltimore and the Yankees battling in game one of that best of seven series. Let's show you what's happened today from the Bronx in New York. Andy Pettit on the mound. Rafael Palmero says Capaya. That home run made it three to two. Baltimore the lead. Bottom of the seventh inning. Armando Benitez, big punch out of Mariano Duncan. Bases loaded, two outs. Yankees fail to score, 4-3 Baltimore. Bottom eight, Derek Jeter sends a high drive deep toward right. Tony Tarasco, the outfielder, goes back to the wall. He doesn't leap. A fan reaches over, makes the grab. Richie Garcia says, no fan interference. Tarasco said, hey, you're out of your mind. It's ruled a home run, 4-4. Four to four. A look at the replay shows the fan clearly over the fence to make that play. That tied the game at four in the bottom of the ninth inning. The Yankees had a chance to win the game. Line drive caught there by Ripken. Double play at second ends the threat. Now 4-4 in the 10th inning in New York. Guys, did Richie miss that call? Was it fan interference or the right call? Hey, Richie Garcia is one of the best umpires and is right on top of the play, but they missed this one right here. Uh, Tony Tarasco was back there. He did everything right. He got to the wall like you're supposed to. Didn't have to jump that high. The ball would have settled right in his glove. That should have been an out. It should have been fan interference. You're right. Richie hustled out there. He thought he saw the play correctly. The ball was caught on the field of play. It should have been called fan interference, although the right fielder didn't play that ball correctly. He should have went back to the wall, jumped, tried to make the play better than that. He didn't have to jump. It was right there. He had yeah. to play. <laughs> so what does that do in that series with the Yankees and Baltimore? The birds really really feel like they're behind the eight ball playing the game under protest now whether or not the protest will be upheld is something the league office will have to decide i don't think it'll be upheld because it doesn't have to do with uh with the rules it had to do with a judgment call that's right you can't you can't protest a judgment call so they're gonna have a tough time clearly some play should have been made there with fan interference no doubt about it so a great ball game in the bronx in new york and we hope to have the same here it's game one between the cardinals and the braves and time now to send it upstairs with our trio Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, and Bob Brindley are ready for the call. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Chip Carey. Well, I guess they have already set the stage. The big things that's going on in baseball right now. we got to talk about the specifics. Getting ready for game number one of the 1996 National League Championship Series with my partners, Bob Brindley and Tim McCarver. Timmy, you look at the world champion Atlanta Braves. You have to look at their starting pitching. They, again, have a staff full of aces. Yeah, Joe, it's perhaps uh, the most familiar chant in all of baseball. We're number one, we're number one. But it's particularly appropriate for the Atlanta Braves' top three pitchers because they could be number one on any staff in baseball, arguably. I'm talking about John Smoltz, Tommy Glavin, and Greg Maddox. Let's take a look at the last three postseason series, including the division series against the Dodgers this year, a composite 7-1 and one record, a ridiculously low ERA, and opponent's batting average, and I'll tell you, Joe, the Cardinals may win this series, but if they do, it'll be against the best pitching staff in baseball. And I think that's the way the Cardinals come into this series. They move to Bob Brenly and Bob, when you talk to Tony La Russa, he's very upfront. He says the Cardinals are underdogs. They come in a bit banged up. Ray Langford, the bad shoulder. Gary Gaetti, the jammed right heel. It's going to take a heck of a series from St. Louis to upset the world champs. Well, Gaetti was one of the American League imports that Tony La Russa brought over here, not only for his leadership on the field, but to provide some thump in the middle of that lineup. Uh, he's not 100% tonight. Ray Langford with the bad shoulder, but he still has the strong legs, and that's the most important thing for this Cardinals team. Because if they're going to beat the Braves in this series, they're going to have to take advantage of their tremendous team speed. Run early, run late, run often, run whenever they get a chance. Also offensively, if the Cardinals can run up the pitch count on the Braves starter, don't allow them to have a low pitch count inning where they can fall into a comfort zone and get back into that dugout quickly, it'll work to the Cardinals' favor. Also, the Cardinals pitching staff has got to keep the ball in the ballpark. In the regular series against the Braves this season, oh, almost half the runs that were scored by the Braves came via the home run, so they're going to have to keep that ball down. In the Atlanta Braves this season, hit the second most home runs in all of the National League, second only to Colorado. No surprise there. We get ready for pitch number one. <laughs> 
National League Championship Series, 1996 style. It's coming your way right after this from your local Fox station, your home for the 1996 World Series. And we get ready for baseball. The Cardinals get ready to take on the Atlanta Braves, and we'll give you a look at the Cardinals' starting lineup. They will lead it off with Ozzie Smith. Ozzie Smith will lead it off. He plays short, hitting 282 during the regular season. Ray Langford batting second in center field. Then it's Ron Gant hitting third and left. He hit 30 home runs during the regular season. Brian Jordan in right. He was a hero in the divisional series against San Diego. Then Gary Gaetti, John Mabry, Tom Pagnazzi, Luis Alisea, and Andy Bennis pitching and batting ninth. A look at the Braves' defense, you highlight Marquise Grissom. He's in center field, won his fourth consecutive Gold Glove Award today. Congratulations to Marquise, and as a tribute, maybe a little highlight package for Marquise in center. He plays shallow, and with this very good Atlanta Braves pitching staff, he takes a lot of hits away. He's as good as there is. He and Brian McRae play shallow in the National League. They go back, they come in, they just get it done. He and the Braves take the field. A nice ovation here at Fulton County Stadium. And who's on the mound? The right-hander, 24-game winner, John Smoltz. Well, John Smoltz is no stranger to postseason play. He feels very comfortable out there on the mound tonight as you see his numbers on the season. Smoltz's numbers against the Cardinals weren't that impressive this season, but it can be traced to really one bad outing. His ERA was well over six against the Cardinals during the regular season. But if Bobby Cox had to pick one of his aces, It'll definitely be John Smoltz this year. Yeah, that bad outing broke a 14-game winning streak. That was on June 24th when John gave up the six earned runs, eight earned runs, against the St. Louis Cardinals. Everything is hard thrown by Smoltz. I think there are a lot of pitchers where you have to make them get it up. With John Smoltz, you have to make him get the ball down and avoid swinging at the high fastball, a slider that he throws about as hard as his fastball, and a devastating split-finger fastball. I mean, take your pick. Who do you want going to the mound in game one? You've got Maddox, you've got Glavin, you throw Smoltz out there, six and one in 14 postseason starts. I mean, Bob Brenly talking about making a choice. Anybody up here can make that choice. <laughs> you, you need a three-headed coin, I think, because uh, you can't go wrong no matter who you send out there to the mound today. The one thing that works a little bit in the Cardinals' favor, they have traditionally, at least this season, been a very good breaking ball hitting team. A lot of guys in their lineup don't necessarily sit on breaking balls, but they have the kind of bat speed that really allows them to get extension on the slider. John Smoltz's best pitch is his slider. He's got a tremendous fastball. As Timmy mentioned, he throws up high in the zone. He's got a tremendous split. But normally when he's going for a strikeout, when he needs an out, he's going to go to his slider. And hypothetically, that plays into the Cardinals' strength. So John Smoltz is second to go get a new glove. Bat Boy just ran a new glove out there to the mound. You don't see that with many pitchers. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it before a start as Smoltz goes out. He wants a new glove. What's going on? Well, he must be anticipating some line drives back through the box and one one with a little more padding. He is ready to roll against the St. Louis Cardinals. The Cardinals here in Atlanta this season won four of the seven meetings. However, they were swept at home by the Braves and we are ready to start it. Earlier in the year, Ozzie Smith waved goodbye to Atlanta Fulton County Stadium fans. This would be the last time Ozzie Smith came through. Uh-uh. The Cardinals win the National League Central Division, and here he is taking on Atlanta back and starting. What a year he has had at the ripe young age of 41 years old. First pitch of the NLCS, and it's in for strike one. Home plate umpire is Paul Rungi with Hirschbeck, Davidson, Joe West on the bases. Jerry Crawford down the left field foul line. Ed Montague down the right field line. Right down the middle again, 0-2. How would you like to be in the major leagues for 19 years and be a better hitter the last year than you were the first year? That's the case with Ozzie Smith. Ball and two strikes from Smoltz with Langford and Gant to follow. John Smoltz a winner in his one division series start game one. At Dodger Stadium went nine full and very strong innings. Ozzie grounds one to McGriff. Easy play, one up, one down.
So that's the way we begin here in Atlanta. Ground out off the bat of Ozzie to start. The batter now, Ray Langford. Isn't it amazing that Ray Langford can play with a torn rotator cuff in his left shoulder? Well, we talked about this earlier today. Ray Langford is one of many guys on this Cardinals team who really has a football mentality. Yeah. He's used to playing with pain. I'm sure he's not 100%. Tony La Russa says that even 75% of Ray Langford's throwing arm is better than most guys at 100%, so we knew he was going to be in that lineup tonight. Strike one off the bat of Langford. Generally speaking, when baseball people hear of a torn rotator cuff, you immediately think operation. But there are degrees of rotator cuff injuries. Dr. Stan London explaining them to us before the game. Maltz was 0-2 on Smith. He's now 0-2 on Langford. Dr. London, the team position of the Cardinals, saying that Langford had a puncture through the four tendons of the shoulder. It is not as severe as it could be, but by throwing and extending, he could injure the arm much more seriously. Langford strikes out in a very strong start for Smoltz. First two are gone here in the first inning. And that was a split finger from John Smoltz that you'll see right here. The bottom just falls out of this pitch on the way to the plate. The arm speed is the same as the fastball, but you can see the action. The ball just goes straight down to the ground. At best, you get a swinging strike. At worst, you get a ground ball out of a pitch like this. So two out, nothing shaking for St. Louis here in the first inning. And the batter will be Ron Gant, who is appearing in his fifth straight National League Championship Series. He breaks his bat. He flies one to Grissom, and the Cardinals go in order in the first. Good start for Smoltz. The world champions back to the dugout. After a half inning in Atlanta, Andy Bennett to work. No score. For Jones doing it again. No sophomore jinx. Fred McGriff cleaning up at first base. He hit 28 home runs during the regular season. Then it's Ryan Klesko, Javier Lopez, Jermaine Dye, Jeff Blauser, and pitching and batting night is John Smoltz. The defense for the Cardinals, Ozzie Smith, 13 Gold Glove Awards at shortstop. He is joined on the infield on the left side by the veteran Gary Gaietti. And on the mound tonight for the Cardinals, opening up the National League Championship Series, right-hander, 18-game winner, Andy Bennett. And Andy Bennett's story is much the same as the Cardinals' story. He opened up the season 1-7 and seven, and then won 17 of his next 20 decisions. When he got hot, the Cardinals got hot about late May. He's another pitcher that has responded very well to the tutelage of Dave Duncan. Made a few mechanical changes in his delivery, taught him to uh, throw the curveball again, a pitch that he had scrapped earlier in his career. He's been working on a change up throughout the season that's developed into a very effective pitch for him. There's the tutelor. There right he is. There. <laughs> The tootle him, right? And the tootle <laughs> Andy Bennis getting ready to work to Marquise Grissom. A 308 hitter during the regular season, and he looks at ball one. Postseason has been unkind to old Marquise. Only one out of 12. One ball, one strike. That was after having a 15-game postseason hitting streak going into the Dodgers series, but the Dodgers pitchers throttled Marquise. He was only one for 12 during that divisional championship series. A ball and a strike from Andy Bennis. Fastball is upstairs, two and one. Here is a guy who definitely goes overlooked in the National League and more specifically on this Atlanta Braves club. Off Bennis. Can't find it initially and recovers for the out. The line drive, Andy's big body knocked it down, and by the time he found it, that good arm, he had time to get Grissom one away. Well, just in case Andy Bennis didn't realize the game had started, Marquise Grissom sent him a wake-up call right there. This is a pitcher's worst nightmare. Facing the first batter of the game, your feet aren't even wet yet. A good slider low and away. Bennis able to get a glove on it, knock it down, has the presence of mind to chase it down and throw him out of first base. Funny, the last at bat during the divisional series, Marquise Grissom lined back to Darren Dreifert, the double play with the bases loaded and one out against the Dodgers. That's one of the reasons he's one out of 13 in the yeah. postseason. One out, nobody on. Here's Lemke. 
And a strike from Bennis Lemke during the divisional playoff with the Dodgers. Two out of 12. Two runs driven in during the regular season, hit 255. He's always been a clutch postseason performer, was the Braves' most valuable player in 91 during the World Series. One ball, one strike. Chipper Jones waiting on deck here in the first inning. Up two and one. 90, 91, the Braves losing to the Minnesota Twins in seven games. Then they lost in 92 to the Toronto Blue Jays in six games and winning last year. Alisea the dive to his right. Good play, two gone. Alisea, who committed a league-high 24 errors during the regular season, took a hit away from his counterpart, Lemke, two out. Yeah, but he made 20 of those, Joe, in the first half of the season. So only four errors in the second half. Tony La Russa sticking with him. Fine play. He actually hit, the, knocked that ball down with his left elbow. And fortunately for Luis, it stayed within his grasp. Good play. So two out, nothing doing for the Braves. Here's Chipper Jones, and he can make something happen in a blink. He takes a strike from Andy Bennett. He hit a home run in the clinching game against the Dodgers. And he loops a base hit into left field with two out here in the first. Now Chipper Jones is a hitter that's mature well beyond his years. A very good at bat right here. Stays on this breaking ball, doesn't try to pull it just goes with the pitch to the opposite field. He realizes that the Cardinals are going to try to stay away from his strength as well as Freddie McGriff and Ryan Klesko try to keep them in the ballpark and Chipper Jones, to his credit, stays on this pitch and just takes what they give him. He's a second-year player that plays like a 10-year player. Jones last year, 23 home runs, 86 driven in this year. 30 home runs, 110 RBI. Oh, hum. Here's McGriff, runner at first, two out here in the first inning, no score. Three out of nine in that Dodger series. Oh, that looked like uh, Tom Pagnazzi took one off the top of the knee in that little crease. Fred McGriff hitting the top half of the ball and it hit right on the top of the knee. You could say, well, that's a padded area, but it's amazing how you can feel those balls through that crease in the shin guard. We can both attest to that. I huh? was gonna say, how come you two cringe every time something like that happens? With good reason. Two out, a runner at first in the 0-1 to McGriff. Caught the outside corner, and quickly an 0-2 count. And that outside corner is going to be a pitch that both teams are going to try to exploit today. Paul Rungi, the home plate umpire, a notorious wide strike zone umpire. Andy Bennis trying to pitch around a two-out single by Chipper Jones. In on the hands of McGriff, and the count stays 0-2. Klesko waiting on deck when you have Jones, McGriff, Klesko, and Javier Lopez in the middle of your order. Especially tough on a right-handed starter. Jones better from the left side. McGriff a lefty, Klesko a left-hander. Good fastball from Venice, one and two. Well, he's trying to exploit the book on Freddie McGriff. Try to go up the ladder when you get two strikes. So he didn't chase that high fastball out of the strike zone, but... Unfortunately for Bennis, this time a little bit too high out of the strike zone. Two out, a runner at first. That's Jiffer Jones. And the one-two to McGriff. He got him looking. McGriff strikes out, and he'll talk to Paul Rungy. He didn't like the call. And the Braves are held scoreless in the first. A two-out hit by Jones. And after one in Atlanta, Braves and Cardinals, no score. the first 
Joe Bach along with Tim McCarver, Bob Brenly. Glad you're with us on Fox. Brian Jordan first up here in the second with Gaetti and Mabry to follow. John Smoltz on the hill for Atlanta. A ball and a strike. Brian Jordan, one of two St. Louis Cardinals who can sleep in their own beds here in Atlanta. Lives in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Ron Gant lives in the Atlanta area. Gets into one to center field, sending Grissom back. At the track, it's over his head. Jordan can fly. He's headed for third and will make it a leadoff stand-up triple. But we talk about Grissom playing shallow. Very rare is the shot that gets over his head and stays in the ballpark, but that's the case of the ball hit by Jordan. Well, this is the kind of ball that will get over his head. A little cut fastball on the outside part of the plate, and he drives it, a line drive over Grissom's head. Any ball with altitude that he can run underneath, he'll get to as he almost got to that ball, but a line drive hit directly over his head is the one ball Marquise Grissom is going to have trouble getting back on. So Smoltz in second inning trouble, runner at third. Nobody out. Now the ball gets away from Lopez. Jordan comes home safe, and the Cardinals take a one to nothing second inning lead. It's squirted away from Lopez, and Jordan, who can fly, exploded to the plate, a wild pitch, and a one to nothing St. Louis lead. That's one of the problems with John Smoltz. About the only problem over the last five years, he has led the National League in wild pitches. Three of those five years, he had ten this year. And Javier Lopez, the ball caroming off the mid, it looked like it hit the heel of the glove. And he couldn't recover in time, and Jordan scores the first run of the ball game. Now Gaetti bats with the bases empty, nobody out. And has a 2-0 count. Understand the New York Yankees get an 11th inning home run from Bernie Williams. And beat the Orioles 5-4. Talked about the controversy during our pregame with... Chip and Dave and Steve. That ball hit by Derek Jeter into right. We will try to give you video of the Bernie Williams home run during this inning. The game winner in the 11th inning. So the Yankees win game number one. Three and one on Gaetti. Gary Gaetti able to play tonight. Jammed his right heel in the finale of that San Diego series and he now has a full count three and two he heard it on that swing too Joe was three and oh now three and two Smoltz has given up a second inning run right through it and the second strikeout of the night for John Smoltz here's what happened at Yankee Stadium in the 11th inning Bernie Williams hitting right-handed off Randy Myers absolutely crushed it and the Yankees who were down in the division playoff to the Rangers come back and win it in Texas now take one game to none lead by winning the opener of the ALCS at Yankee Stadium. Here's Mabry, one out, nobody on in this crowd, which is less than capacity here at Fulton County Stadium. Awfully quiet here in the second. One ball, one strike on Mabry. A late arriving crowd. Probably not going to show up until the World Series. <laughs> late arriving by about a week. Yeah, by about a week. I wonder if it's become so old hat, so familiar to have the Braves here that it loses its luster here in Atlanta. Strike two on Mabry because it's hard to justify how a National League Championship Series game number one isn't sold out and they are well short. One out, nobody on, and now Mabry strikes out and that's three strikeouts for John Smoltz in an inning and two-thirds. Well, Smoltz will occasionally pitch himself into trouble by trying to be too fine. We saw him on Gaetti fall behind early by trying to nip that outside corner, and he was missing too far away. 
With this kind of stuff, uh, unless the hitter is just somebody who's absolutely creamed him throughout his career, John Smoltz is a lot better to go right after these guys. Now Pagnazzi fouls back, strike one. Pagnazzi had a big year this year, a career-high 13 home runs, hit 270. Dave Duncan and Tony La Russa will tell you what he added to this team behind the plate. Handling this Cardinal pitching staff was invaluable. Nothing and two, the count from John Smoltz. Leo Mazzoni, the pitching coach for Atlanta, sweating through it with John Smoltz, who now has an LCS record, 49 strikeouts in his career. <laughs> 0 2 to Pagnazzi. Ball and two strikes. Only five more strikeouts for John, and he will tie Whitey Ford for the all time strikeout leader in postseason play. Ford with 94. Bob Gibson with 92, Jim Palmer with 90. There is number four on the night. The Cardinals get a run, a leadoff triple from Jordan after an inning and a half, one to nothing, St. Louis. Play the cars more Americans trust by the NASDAQ stock market. Visit www.nasdaq.com. By Network MCI, we have the power to put it all together for your business. And by Alliance Capital, investing without the mystery. Awfully quiet here in Fulton County Stadium, bottom of the second inning. The Cardinals have taken an early lead on a triple by Brian Jordan. He scored on a wild pitch. And Tony La Russa and his crew. A little smile on the face of La Russa. They have to be awfully pleased, Tim, that they get an early lead in a series where they are clearly the underdog. Yeah, baseball, a game of first. First strike, first out in the inning, first run in the game. If you do that more than the other guys, generally speaking, you're going to end up on the plus side. It's Ryan Klesko leading it off second inning. One to nothing, St. Louis. Klesko, a 282 hitter during the regular season. With 34 home runs, one and two from Andy Bennis. Yeah, motion is such a big part of postseason play as well, and you always want to score that first run as you guys were talking about. Get the lead. It makes you feel so much more comfortable as the game goes on to force that other team into a comeback mode right away. One and two on Klesko. Out of the way of it. Two balls, two strikes. That's a big difference between Andy Bennis now and Andy Bennis in years past. Not afraid to come inside. 2-2. Got him over the outside corner, one away. And the second strikeout for Bennis. And the first out here in the second inning. He struck out Fred McGriff on a fastball away. You see how Pagnazzi sets up. That ball slicing the outside corner. And perhaps set up by the fastball at his knees on yeah. the pitch before. Right. Andy Bennis making his fifth postseason start. Of course, last year was traded from San Diego, the team that made him their first selection when he began professional baseball. Lopez flies to right. Jordan puts it away, two up, two down to the second. So Andy Bennis ends up in Seattle, made 12 starts for the Mariners last year, was 7-2, and two, did not fare that well in the postseason, but... It's almost fair to say Andy Bennis now in 1996, especially since the first month of the regular season is history. From then on, he's a different pitcher now. I think a lot of that he attributes to Dave Duncan, the Cardinal pitching coach. Two out, nobody on. The batter is Jermaine Dye, the number seven hitter. And he takes ball one. You know, for years when Andy Bennis was with the Padres, it was hard for people around the league to figure out why he didn't win more games. Tremendous stuff, overpowering fastball, but he might just be one of those late bloomers who has suddenly realized how to pitch in the major leagues, and as Tim mentioned, Dave Duncan had a lot to do with that. 2-0, the count on Die with two out, nobody on in the second. Up the middle, Ozzy, a diving catch to his left. He may be 41 years old, folks, but he can still do it. After two in Atlanta, the Cardinals lead one to nothing. We'll be back to Fulton County after this from your local Fox station.
Ozzie Smith comes to a close in 1996, and Tim, he can still do it. And the one thing that Ozzie does, because he does not have a strong throwing arm anymore, he does play a lot of right-handed hitters up the middle because that throw in the hole, he can't make that throw effectively anymore anyway. Been playing with a torn rotator cuff since 1985 for 11 years. It's kind of the common injury with the Cardinals coming yeah, into this right. postseason. You've got Ozzy, you've got Gant, you've got Langford. They're concerned about Brian Jordan's left shoulder. Here's Alessia leading it off, and John Smoltz is absolutely bringing gas. Louie hit 258 during the regular season. Cardinals may have picked up that second inning run, but Smoltz is going to be awful tough here tonight. A ball and a strike on Alisea with Andy Bennis to follow, then Ozzy. I think John's throwing hard. Well, oh, that's the pitch we were talking about earlier that you've got to lay off of. That letter-high fastball. You either pop it up or swing through it. Got to make him get the fastball down in the zone. Last one registered 94 miles per hour. Two balls, two strikes on Alisea. And then after he gets you to two strikes with the good fastball, he's also got the hard slider. He could throw down and into a left-handed hitter. But that pitch right there, the split finger in the dirt, very tough to lay off of. That was interesting. Tony La Russa, we mentioned it a little bit in the pregame about the Cardinals hitters need to have good at bats. Try to work deep in the count. He said he really wants them to stick their nose in there when they get two strikes. Try to foul off as many pitches as they can. Make these Braves starters throw a lot of pitches. 2-2 to Alisea. Popped it up. On the right side for who? McGriff will take it. And the leadoff man is gone here in the third inning for St. Louis. When you were a kid, there was always one house in the neighborhood your parents wanted you to stay away from. Now you'll find out why. Because your first step inside this house could be your last. Don't miss a brand new X-Files Friday, 9 Eastern, 8 Central, right here on Fox. Now that was my house. That was the friendly house. <laughs> house on Elm Street. <laughs> One out, nobody on. Here's Andy Bennett. In the left field, well hit. Klesko going back. Over his head, up against the wall. And Andy Bennett has a one-out double here in the third. Well, a lot of the Cardinals hitters have been going after that first fastball with no success. So Andy Bennett said, I'll step up here and show you how to do it. John Smoltz, just a get-ahead fastball right down the middle of the plate. Andy Bennett looked like a hitter on that swing. Well, the Atlanta Braves know something about pitchers who can hit. It was Tommy Glavin's double that opened up a four-run inning against the Dodgers in game three of that divisional series in the fourth inning. Game one by the Braves, five to two. Lavin will be the pitcher in game three in St. Louis on Saturday. So Ben is the runner at second, one out for Ozzie Smith, and he takes ball one high. Smith is first time grounded out to first. Playing in his fourth league championship series. 1982, 1985, 1987. One ball, one strike. The one thing you have to do with Ozzie Smith, you have to cut off that little flare the other way. Ryan Klesko is about three steps too deep right now. And Marquis Grissom, a guy who usually plays shallow, is actually too deep in center field. Ozzie cannot hit the ball that far on a line the other way or to center field. You have to take that flare away from it. And taking the defensive alignment one step further, Chipper Jones in on the grass to take away the bunt, and Ozzie does not bunt for base hits that often, particularly with the runner in scoring position. Into left field, Plesko going back to get it. Plenty of time to get there. Bennett will tag, makes his way to third, and he is safe with two out here in the inning. Aggressive base running by Andy Bennis as Klesko had to go back to catch the pop-up. I think the reason that Bennis took off was that Ryan Klesko caught the ball going back. Remember, we said Ozzie Smith couldn't hit a ball on a line there. 
the loft of the ball allows Klesko to get back on the ball. He's not in a position to make the throw, and Bennis lumbers into third, where you do not like to see your starting pitcher go in head first to any bag. For some reason, Joe West, the third base umpire, never made a safe or out call. By not making a call at all or any sort of a hand gesture, you assume safe, so... Well, he hasn't told anybody to get off the field, so that's the second out, not the second and third. And Venice is the third with two out for Ray Lankford. Lankford struck out his first time up. The postseason prior to this series had only two at-bats in game three of the division series against San Diego. Our Fox box, your top left-hand corner of your screen. You see the count, which is now one and one, two out. The score and a runner at third, which in this case, that little dot ought to be heaving in and out because I think Andy is still out of breath. Venice in third, represented by that red dot on our Fox box. But remember the wild pitch? Absolutely. With Jordan on at third, 11 wild pitches, including that wild pitch back in the second inning. One ball, one strike, Smoltz gets a strike, and it's one and two. Well, we said the Cardinals were going to have to be aggressive on the bases, but it wasn't insinuating that Andy Pennis should be the one being aggressive, but I guess it's infectious. Just like they say hitting is contagious, I guess aggressive base running is contagious, too. The Atlanta fans want the fifth strikeout of the night from John Smoltz right here. That's foul, and the count stays one and two. Andy Bennis, the one-out double. Ray Langford trying to bring him home with two out. Trying to add to the St. Louis one-to-nothing third-inning lead. One, two to Langford, just inside, two and two. You're more likely to get the called strike a little bit off the outside corner, sometimes a lot off the outside corner with Paul Rungi behind the plate than you are to get that inside strike. That's well off the inside corner, but he will normally go a little bit off the outside corner, give that pitcher the benefit of the doubt, and take away a little bit of the inside corner. Two, two. Off the plate, easy play, Smoltz. John gets around a one-out double from Andy Bennis. Braves bat bottom of the third inning. They trail St. Louis by one. Hey, help me figure this out. Usually the more gizmos you want. Without winning a World Series title. We posed that question on October 9th, 1996. I give up. Good try. Yeah. <laughs> you really, you really gave, you really gave yourself a chance. Here's Blauser leading it off, taking ball one low and away. Speaking of chances, the Jeff Blauser hoping he has a better chance against Andy Bennett. He's three for 46 lifetime, 0 for his last 36 at bat. And as you can see, did not have a good division series against the Dodgers. Had only the one hit. Well, there are those who would say he is due. But, you know, Bobby Cox told us before the game a lot of his managing style is playing hunches, and he feels that Blauser's the right man for the job tonight. Of course, the Braves have the option because they picked up Terry Pendleton mm -hmm. to at any point during this series, really during the postseason, although it hasn't happened yet, move Chipper Jones to short and insert Terry Pendleton at third. But not the way Bobby Cox wanted to go here in the opener of the NLCS. There's Chipper Jones. There's a strike. It's two and two. Bobby thought that ball was low. I don't blame him. Spit his gum out <laughs> and kicked it. Two, two. One away as Ben has changed up. And that's strikeout number three. First out here in the third inning. Here comes John Smoltz. And here are his thoughts on starting game one of the NLCS. Uh, I think postseason brings brings upon a clean slate. 
it wipes everything that you've ever done during the regular season out because it's a totally different season. Uh, the pressure's greater. Guys do things different. I'm a guy that stays the same. When the postseason comes about, I think this is what I should be doing. I, I want to pitch game one. And really wasn't that the charge against John Smoltz prior to this year. He's so good in the postseason. Six and one in 14 postseason starts coming in. Why doesn't he do it during the regular season? Well, he did with 24 wins. Strike two on Smoltz. Well, sometimes you find yourself playing your career trying to live up to expectations instead of just going out and doing what you're capable of doing. And I think perhaps that at least part of John Smoltz's problem in the past was exactly that. Smoltz trying to return the favor and do something against Andy Bennis. Bennis doubling at the top of this inning. Smoltz able to get around it. Bennis has struck out three. Make it four. Well, since Bob Brentley is already elected to just forget about <laughs> trying to come up with an answer to our Aflac trivia question, who has appeared in the most postseason games without winning a World Series title? Dom, heard Dom DiMaggio. I'll just throw that out. <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't hear anything out of McCarver. Kerry Pendleton. <laughs> How about that? Wow. Of course, missing last year's World Series title with Atlanta while spending the season in Florida. Was with St. Louis in 1985, and the Cardinals lost to Kansas City after being up three games to one. Lost to Minnesota in 1987. Of course, was hurt during that World Series against Minnesota in 1987. It's Grissom, one out of 13. Braves have to get him going. Andy Bennis rolling right along. That's strike two as Bennis has a shot now to strike out the side here in the third inning. You know, amazing that Atlanta swept that series with the Dodgers while at the plate they hit only 180. It was all pitching with a team ERA of less than one run against the Dodgers. And the, and the Braves only scored 10 runs, six of those runs as a result of home runs. You said in the opening about uh, the Braves against the Cardinals. The Braves hitting 21 home runs against St. Louis this year. Grissom, who's at the plate now, had six of those 21. That caught the outside corner. There's your wide strike zone. And Bennett strikes out the side after three in Atlanta. Cardinals surprising the Braves. They lead by one. I think Cardinals top of the fourth. You do not overmatch major league hitters that often. But I'll tell you, Andy Bennett's overmatching Marquise Grissom in that last at bat. A lot of overmatching going on here in game one of the NLCS with the way Smoltz and Bennis are both pitching. There's ball one to Ron Gant who fly to center as he broke his bat. First time up. Gant leading off. He took a fastball strike, one and one. Cardinals have the game's only run. It came on a leadoff triple off the bat of Brian Jordan in the second. He then scored on a wild pitch. Good pitch from Smoltz. Split finger delivery and a 1-2 count on Gant. Brian Gant, as you can see, an inside hitter. Some guys like it down, other guys up. Gant inside. Two balls, two strikes. Uh, he's as quick inside as any right-handed hitter in the National League. And if you're going to try to get inside on him, you better make sure it's off the plate inside where you can tie him up on his hands because anything from the middle of the plate, even a couple inches off the inside corner is a pitch he can get around on. Fourth inning, Gant leading off in a two-ball, two-strike count. Full count with Jordan and Gaetti to follow. Ron Gant signed before the start of the regular season by the Cardinals, a five-year, $25 million contract. Got it. And for Smoltz, strikeout number five. And Bennis has number five. We were talking about Marquise Grissom, that is that. Four straight fastballs to Grissom. The first one was away 
for a call strike. Then the swinging strike, he tried to come inside. Grissom fights it off. Another fastball on the corner. Both of these guys are throwing gas out there tonight. Heavy fastballs on the black. There's another one in strike one to Brian Jordan. Well, you wonder at what point and which team will be the first one to try to step out of the batter's box, maybe take a little more time between pitches, try to do something to break up this rhythm. When Smoltz gets into a rhythm, forget it. And with both pitchers in their rhythm, you wonder how big that one run is. A triple and a wild pitch, that's it. In fact, the Cardinals have only two hits. Bennis has the other, a one-out double in the third. Jordan breaks his back two out. Appeared to be a flip finger there from John Smolt that really dove down and into the right-handed hitting Brian Jordan. Well, when you have to cheat a little bit to get to that good fastball and then they drop a split finger fastball like that on the inside corner, you're, you're going to break some bats. You're going to get a lot of funny looking swing. And now as Gary Gaetti comes to the plate, the Braves put on an infield shift that they used against him during the regular season. There's strike one. They play Lemke straight up the middle. In fact, on the shortstop side of second base. And Gary Gaetti had one hit against the San Diego Padres, and that was a home run to right center field to win game one. Trying to go the other way, and he flies to right. Jermaine Dye is there. Another one, two, three inning for Smoltz. And we head to the bottom of the fourth, ripping through three and a half, and the Cardinals out in front by one. And a mount fit on a nice October night in Atlanta. The night for overalls, right? Absolutely. And overall, these two pitchers have been dominating. Andy Bennis and John Smoltz, sorry. Fourth inning. I thought I'd slip one in. <laughs> Lemke looks at one outside. It'll be Lemke, Chipper Jones, Fred McGriff. Chance here for the Braves to get something going. They have only the one hit, a two-out flare base hit. Off the bat of Jones, back in the first. The fastball from Bennis again, one ball, one strike. Center field, Langford going back to get it. And Lemke is the first out here in the fourth inning. Well, folks, remember tomorrow it's game two of the National League Championship Series. When Brian Jordan and the Cardinals face off against Greg Maddox, the defending champion Atlanta Braves. The road to the World Series on Fox continues beginning at 8 Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific tomorrow. Another good pitching matchup with Todd Stottlemyre for St. Louis. Greg Maddox for Atlanta. Here's Chipper Jones, ball one. Three hundred hitter this postseason so far. A squirter, Gaetti, tough play, base hit, and it gets away. Chipper Jones will stay put. As that ball hit the tarpaulin roll down the right field foul line. Up against the stands and Chipper Jones played it safe. And it's a straight base hit, no error. That was a terrific play by Luis Alasea backing up that play. Had Jones, after the overthrow by Gaetti, gone immediately, he makes it to second base. The one-hop throw getting by John Mabry, an in-between hop, but Alisea backing up the play to hold Jones to first base. So a one-out single here in the fourth inning, and that gets the crowd into it. One-on-one -on -one out for Fred McGriff. McGriff struck out looking his first time, and he takes ball one high. Well, the beginnings of the first chop of the evening that started and stopped rather quickly. The one-pitch chop. <laughs> Chipper Jones at first, one out. McGriff breaks his bat and flies to center. 
two out. So the Braves cannot get anything going, and Fred McGriff will need a new one. His next time to the plate. Well, it's surprising McGriff hits this ball as far as he does. Got it just down near the trademark a little bit, but when a big, strong guy who's down on the very knob of that bat does not hit the sweet spot of the bat, something has to give. And in this case, the bat exploded on Fred McGriff. Well, both of these pitchers are going through some pump tonight, aren't they? Man, they are charged up. Andy Venice, John Smoltz. Venice now trying to pitch around a one-out infield hit by Jones. Deals with Plesco Chipper, by the way, 14 out of 15 during the regular season in the stolen base department. And in the postseason, one out of two. Missed for ball one to Ryan Klesko. You saw Andy Bennett step off a couple of times. Usually an organization that is traditionally rich in stolen bases. The St. Louis Cardinals with Lou Brock before Ricky Henderson broke his all-time record. Always known as fastball clubs. Usually they know how to defend against the stolen base too. Cardinal pitchers have been traditionally very good at holding runners on. And that works with La Russa with all his years with Ricky Henderson right. in the American League. Right, if you have speed on your club, then you know how to defend against it and how to teach your pitchers to hold other runners closer. Keeping an eye on Chipper Jones at first, two out. They had him leaning, but Chipper able to get back. With that microphone in the bag, you can hear Chipper Jones getting back, and it looked like they almost caught him leaning. I think he definitely was leaning. You know, there are those that say Chipper Jones could steal a lot more bases, and I have to agree with that. As you see the play here at first base, Jones back safely under the tag. Knocked his hand off a little bit, but, but with the Braves lineup and the power they have, it's ridiculous to run into a lot of outs. Yeah, most of the time Chipper Jones is on base. Either McGriff or Klesko is going to be up, and you hate to take that hole away from him on the right side, number one. And you hate to, when they do hit a home run, for it to be a solo shot. Andy Bennis during the regular season allowed 28 home runs. Klesko hit 34. And now a 2-2 count, and Chipper Jones was running on that pitch. Tony La Russa is guiding his third different franchise into the postseason first the White Sox in 83 then all those great years with Oakland and now in his first year in the National League and with the Cardinals St. Louis won the National League Central Division runner going let's go base hit right field Jones will head to third here's the throw by Jordan they hold chipper at third and it's first and third two out you could almost see Ray Lankford giving way to Jordan because had Lankford fielded the ball, Jimmy Williams, the third base coach, is going to send Jones because of the torn rotator cuff. Jones running on the pitch, and this ball by the diving Alisea into right center field. Lankford and Jordan converging, but it's Jordan who makes the play because he's the guy with the stronger arm. The Cardinals went over this before the game. They had to. Absolutely, Tim. I agree. I'm sure they addressed this before the game that any ball hit either in the air or on the ground between the outfielders. If it's a play where you need to make a strong throw, let the guy with the strong arm pick it up. Which really, Tim, goes against what is normally thought of for a center fielder. Normally, a center fielder takes charge, and if he right. can get to the ball, he'll take it. But not tonight and not during this series with the torn rotator cuff of Lankford. Jones was running on the base hit up the middle. Went first to third and had half a mind to try to circle the bases and score. Well, he's going hard at this point. He's anticipating scoring on this play. He looks up and Jimmy Williams, the third base coach, was reading the relay. Jordan made a good, strong chest-high throw to Alisea. Jimmy Williams had to throw up the stop sign. So now first and third, two out as the Braves threaten for the first time tonight. And it's up to Javier Lopez. Javi fly to right his first time up. Two out of eight in postseason play.
To the shortstop, Smith. The flip, the out. Andy Bennis and the Cardinals out of trouble in the fourth. And now after four, as the Braves threaten for the first time, Cardinals hanging on by one. And from on high as we get into the fifth inning, Fulton County Stadium, John Mabry leads it off. Cardinals out in front, one to nothing. What does John Mabry do? Outfield hitch by direction. Spread it around pretty well. And that's why a lot of people in the National League think John Mabry is the real deal. He's going to be a good hitter for years to come. He's from foul line to foul line. Tim, we've talked about it before. Mabry, last year as a rookie, hit 307, but really concentrated on going the other way, using the left side of the field. Now starting to pull with more authority. Strike two. And certainly he's done that against the Braves, too, because Marquise Grissom is drifted toward left center field. Big hole in right center for Mabry. 0-2 from Smoltz. To the left side for Blouser. Easy hop. One away. Now both these ball clubs are going to have to call their bat companies after this game. That's about a dozen bats that have been broken already through the first four innings of this ball game. Mabry retired. Folks, this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced retransmitted in any form without express written consent. With that out of the way, here's Bagnazzi. One out, nobody on, and ball one. Bagnazzi, who struck out his first time. Well, you mentioned earlier what a great influence Pagnazzi's had on this Cardinal pitching staff, particularly the guys that came over from the American League. Uh, it can't be understated how important it is to have a veteran catcher behind the plate who knows the hitters in the league and can really take that decision-making process out of the hands of the pitching staff, put it on the catcher. 2-0. And a right for Jermaine Dye. Two out here in the fifth inning, and Smoltz just continuing to roll. Think about the newness with the Cardinals, new owners, a new manager, a lot of new players, new grass at Bush Stadium in St. Louis. And I think with Tony La Russa, a new resilience and new determination for this ball club too. They have been like a gathering storm. They have gotten better as the season has gotten older. Well, there's no doubt since May 19th, the Cardinals 26 games over the 500 mark, and it took until the middle of May. These players to understand what La Russa was trying to do, for La Russa to understand what kind of players he had, and for La Russa to figure out what's going on in the National League. One ball, one strike on Alisea. Two out of 12 in the postseason tonight, 0 for 1. Alisea had a very good playoff last year for Boston. Two and one from Smoltz. Then Luis was released by the Red Sox in spring training in late March because the Red Sox decided to give the job, the second base job, to Will Cordero. He had a fine year with the Cardinals. Two out, nobody on. Smoltz looking for another perfect inning. Three and one now on Alisea with Andy Bennis waiting on deck. Gentlemen, I Peter. think that's Eddie Perez. I think that's another catcher. I don't want to. Peter O'Toole, Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> There's a two out walk to Luis Alisea. And the first walk issued tonight by either pitcher. And actually, a pitch that we have seen called strike yeah. earlier in this ball game. Mm -hmm. Not that far off the outside corner, perhaps a little bit down. And, and a big pitch, too, don't you think, Bob? Because that allowed Dallas to walk. Not that this is going to be a big inning for the Cardinals. I mean, it might be, but against all odds. But at least it clears Andy Bennett to where you get the top of the lineup leading off in the sixth inning. Bennett has already doubled tonight. And gets strike one from John Smoltz, who had retired seven in a row for that two-out walk to Alisea. Two out of three in the postseason. 
His first hit was a very big hit to help the Cardinals win game two of that series with San Diego. And as you mentioned, Tim, with two outs in the inning, you wouldn't anticipate that triggering a big inning here by the Cardinals, but perhaps that is something that has now thrown Smoltz a little bit out of his rhythm as he misses with that pitch there to Andy Bennis. These two almost matching pitch for pitch so far tonight. Well, now two and one on Andy Bennis after the two-out walk to Alisea. Well, showing a little respect there to Andy Bennis rather than just throwing a 1-1 fastball right down the middle like he did the first time up. It was a good hard slider low and away in the dirt. A nice job by Javi Lopez to keep that ball in front. Smoltz behind on the count, two and one. Now three and one, and maybe it will trigger a big inning. A walk to the number eight hitter. Now three and one on Venice with Ozzie Smith waiting on deck. Well, if you're Tony La Russa, do you give your pitcher the green light on three and one? Got to say, yeah, after he hit a double off the wall his first at bat. He took ball four. Back-to-back -back walks with two out here in the fifth. And this Fulton County Stadium crowd growing a little restless with those two walks issued by Smoltz. There's the fastball for the strike, and then he missed with the fastball. The breaking ball in the dirt, and then he missed down and missed down again. The one thing that Leo Mazzoni said was that sometimes John Smoltz will turn his number toward home plate too much and be down in the strike zone. If there's one thing that he looks for, it's that. He doesn't square up properly when he throws that fastball, and clearly over the last two hitters, walking Alisea on the 3-1 count and now walking the pitcher. Lopez out to talk, but I'm sure that's what Leo Mazzoni's thinking right now. And now facing a career nemesis in Ozzie Smith. He looks at a ball. Alisea at second base is taking an unusually long lead out there. John Smoltz's last 11 pitches, nine have been balls. It's been a 17-pitch inning for Smoltz, two on, two out. Smith pops it up. McGriff back to get it. Takes care of it. So John Smoltz, a couple of two-out walks, gets away with it. Braves back, bottom of the fifth. They trail by one. Sports coverage. Very quiet crowd here at Fulton County Stadium. Bottom of the fifth inning, and so far the Cardinals have been in command. Although the Braves have out-hit St. Louis, the Cardinals have the game's only run, and Andy Bennis has struck out five, allowing no runs on three hits. Jermaine Dye will lead it off. Bottom three in the Atlanta lineup coming up. The numbers for Dye in the postseason, two out of 12. This is his rookie season. One of his two hits, a home run at Dodger Stadium in game two of that series. Bennis starts him with strike one. That was a game winner off this male Valdez on a high hanging curveball. This young man with a ton of talent. Played in 98 games during the regular season. Recalled on May 16th, day after David Justice dislocated his shoulder. The game here against Pittsburgh. Another good fastball from Andy Bennis in game two. Jermaine Dye hit that high hanging breaking ball of Ishmael Valdez. It was the second home run of the inning. The third of the night for Atlanta. They went on behind Greg Maddox. Make Michael and Wohlers to a 3-2 win. Strike zone changing a little bit here as this game is worn on. Smoltz isn't getting that pitch just off the plate. Now neither is Andy Bennis. Two balls, two strikes. Blouser on deck and then John Smoltz. Three and two. Well, once again, that pitch just a little bit too far even for Paul Rung. Full count on Die leading off. Got it. 
And for Venice, strikeout number six, and he threw it right by the rookie, Jermaine Dodd. This week, it's a Fox NFL Sunday doubleheader. Where the Cardinals battle the Cowboys, and the Eagles battle the Giants in two key NFC East matchups. Plus other exciting regional action. It all begins at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Check local listings for the game and time in your area. The National Football League right here on Fox. Here's Blouser, and he takes the ball. Andy Bennis in his second start of the season. Second start as a Cardinal on the 6th of April. Pitch Deer hooked up with Greg Maddox and went eight innings, allowing two runs on four hits. Did not get a decision in that game. Here's Blouser down the right field line. It's clear. Blouser will hold it first as Jordan got to it in a blink. A one-out hit for Blouser. And only his second hit of this postseason. That is his first hit off Andy Bennett in his last 37 at bat dating back to 1991. And the Braves hoping that it came at a good time. Fine play by Jordan to get to that ball and hold Blouser to a single. The Gold Glove outfielders this year in the National League, Steve Finley, Barry Bonds, Marquise Grissom. He could have made a very strong case for Brian Jordan to win his first Gold Glove in 1996. Here's Smoltz up there to bunt. Ball one. Jordan has the total package in right field, a strong throwing arm, tremendous foot speed, and absolutely no fear of an outfield wall or diving in the gap after a ball, running on the warning track. That's that football mentality again we talked about earlier. See if Bobby Cox changes the bunt to a hit and run with Smoltz, a good hitter. Playing it straight, Smoltz fouls it for strike one. Boy, it's fun to visit with Bobby Cox. I mean, he is as simple about the game of baseball as it gets. Simple, brilliant, absolutely. And we said this during the division series, you can make a very strong case year after year after year that Bobby Cox is the manager of the year in the National League. This team does not run itself. He gets a very good team pointed in the right direction. And everybody plays hard. And, and you very rarely see a Bobby Cox managed team show any kind of panic or fear or or confusion in a situation. They're always very poised. They know their roles. They know what's expected of them, and they just quietly go about their business and keep winning ball games. Over the last six years, no team has won more games in the big leagues than the Braves. A little low, two balls and a strike. Braves have won 550 games. Over the last six seasons, Bobby Cox winning his first world championship last year. It's a good time to put a hit and run on here because you have your second baseman covering first, Mabry the first baseman charging, Gaetti's charging, the infield in a state of flux. One on, one out. And now a 2-2 count on Smoltz and you can hear John yelling at himself. Now a 2-2 count and set up for the strikeout. Well, he laid off a low fastball on the pitch before, which is actually a much better pitch to bunt than this one. The high fastball up around the letters, particularly with the kind of motion that Bennett can get on that high fastball, too tough to get on top of. A one-out hit by Blouser, and now Smoltz a two-ball, two-strike count. going, Smoltz spunts it foul and he strikes out. And that will not make Bobby Cox happy, nor will it make John Smoltz happy. Takes a nice big deep breath and calmly walks back to the dugout before he goes and destroys the bat rack. Well, Smoltz said that's one of the biggest parts of his maturation process in the big league was learning how to get over when he had a bad start, when he had a bad inning as a pitcher. And now he's going to have to learn how to get over a bad punt. And it doesn't look like he's going to do it anytime soon. <laughs> I'm driving, Keith, come on. 
That's the sound of a helmet falling as John intentionally missed, putting it in its nice, neat little cubby hole. One on, two out. The batter is Grissom. Fastball right down the middle, and Tim, there it is again. Yet another fastball to Marquise Grissom. One fastball after another. Dennis, even the breaking balls he is throwing have been hard. He's gone to the slider as opposed to the curveball. Runner at first, two out. And a one ball, one strike count on Grissom. Braves only rally so far came last inning. A one out hit by Chipper Jones. The grip fly out for the second out. Jones was running in Plesco. Singled into right center. They held Jones at third and Lopez. Bounced into a force out. Fast ball away. Runner is going. Grissom to the left side. A base hit. Ozzie knocks it away. Here comes Blauser. They'll hold him at third. And it's second and third. Two out. Braves trying to open things up. That's the second inning in a row that they, with two outs, they have had Jones running the last inning, Clouds are running this inning. It's a double, and a very unusual double it is for Marquise Grissom. Off the edge of the glove, or the webbing of the glove of Ozzie Smith, had he not deflected that ball, it would have been first and second. All right, the very worst first and third had Blouser elected to go to third. So Biazzi putting leather on that glove, now a base hit, puts Atlanta out in front for the first time tonight. Very good speed with a trail runner Grissom. It's up to Mark Lemke. In the divisional series, one was a double that scored two runs, and now the single that scores two runs puts the Braves on top for the first time tonight. He doesn't get a lot of hits, but it seems like they're all big ones. Now Jones into left, another hit. And a four-hit inning for Atlanta. Three straight hits on three straight pitches. And that's why I think Dave Duncan is out there now. Not that Andy Bennett isn't throwing the ball well, but just to slow things down. And step back and look at the situation. You know, so many times, particularly in postseason, you will hear guys talk about adrenaline. You know, the adrenaline's really pumping. One thing you have to be careful of, you reach a point where that adrenaline runs out. Yeah. And suddenly that fastball that was blowing by people earlier in the game is in that hitting zone and doesn't have that same kind of pop on it. And you mentioned Andy Bennett has been going all hard stuff to this point. Hard fastball, hard sliders. And Duncan's probably reminding him, hey, you've got two other pitches to use. Don't fall in love with that fastball. Two runs are home. It's a four-hit inning for Atlanta. They're getting high tech around here. <laughs> and the batter is Fred McGriff. 0 for 2, but he could bust this game wide open with one swing. Right back to the fastball.
Cardinals get Mark Benkajic ready in their bullpen. But as you say, Jim, it's not a case of Andy Venice not throwing out. No, he's still throwing very hard. The location's got to improve a bit. One, two to McGriff. Right at Ozzie. Tough hop, stays with it, inning over. But the Braves break on top. Two runs, four hits, two left. After five in Atlanta, two to one. World champions. How about the sixth inning in Atlanta? What does that have in store for us? Two to one, the Braves out in front. A two-run bottom of the fifth inning, and Ray Langford will lead off against John Smoltz. Strike one. Ray Langford so far tonight, 0 for 2. He struck out. He's tapped back to Smoltz. Sir John is saying to himself, all right, now they gave me the lead. Let's go to it. Smoltz has allowed only one run on two hits. Into center field, hard hit right at Grissom, one out. That'll bring in Ron Gant, a former Brave. He was part of the start of this great run for Atlanta. Here are his thoughts on getting a chance to sleep in his own bed. You know, I still live here in the winter, and it's, it's nice to come home and uh, sleep in your own bed. I, I slept like a rock last night, so it's good, uh, you know, but there's a lot of emotion here. I went through uh, uh, some good times and bad times here, and... Uh, you know, it's, it's a very emotional time for me. Ron Gant still harbors a lot of frustration and I think ill will toward the Atlanta Braves organization for releasing him when he broke his leg in that dirt bike accident. He broke his leg in December. He was released before March 15th. The Braves had to pay one-fifth of his contract, about $970,000 at the time. Signed a contract for right around $5 million a year. Two and one. I don't know how you can blame Atlanta if you're on Gant. And things worked out well for Gant. The Reds gave him a shot. They gave him a bigger contract last year. He went to the LCS with Cincinnati. And now he gets an enormous contract from St. Louis. Into right field for Jermaine Dye. Two up, two down. Well, when the Braves have guys like Jermaine Dye and Ryan Klesko and Andrew Jones waiting in the weeds down in the minor league, yep. they make that decision a lot easier. If you see Jermaine Dye make a nice running catch on a ball hit right at him, one of the toughest plays for an outfielder is that line drive hit right at them. You don't know how to react initially. I got a good read on that ball, came in and made a good play. What you bring up, Bob, is really the start of the same reasoning behind questioning whether David Justice will be back with his Atlanta team next year. Big contract, they have to sign Smoltz, jury out as to whether they will re-sign Avery. Both will become free agents. And they have so many people capable of filling in Jermaine Dye or Andrew Jones. Justice may be traded. 0-2 oh, on Jordan. Two out, nobody on. Smoltz is rolling. Drop down sidearm, and Jordan stays at 0-2. Oh, see Smoltz do that very often. I don't think I've ever seen John drop down sidearm and throw a fastball to a right-handed batter. He may have done it because he's so pumped up. Sometimes you do things you don't plan on doing. 0-2 oh, to Jordan. Got it! Smoltz dropping down. How much better can this guy get? Giving the Cardinals a new look and the Braves still lead by one. Being successful in the big leagues is making adjustments on the fly. John Smoltz drops down. Throws a high fastball to Jordan. Watch Jordan buckle on this next pitch. A slider from the same slot. I don't think Brian Jordan's seen that because I know I have never seen Neither John Smoltz drop down like that before. Nope. Jordan, the sixth strikeout victim for Smoltz, and now Klesko, the breaking ball from Venice, strike one. Ryan Klesko leaps it off, and Lopez then die. Braves a two-run fifth inning, and they lead two to one. There's that old tired catcher. <laughs> Just can't Bradley. give up that gear. That's a bad uni right there, I'll tell you. That is a bad uni. 
That guy's got that one. Do you think he's superstitious? Do you think he puts the cape on first, then the epaulets, then, then the chest protector, or he starts with the headdress and then puts the mask on? <laughs> Postseason has done some funny things to some people. I got a feeling he put that on after he got to the ballpark because if he was walking around the streets of Atlanta dressed like that, chances are he wouldn't even be here right now. A ball and two strikes on Ryan Klesko leading off. Sixth inning. Off the end of the bat into left for Gant. One away. Here is our Mitsubishi Championship update. In NLCS history, teams that have won the first game of the series have gone on to win 16 of 26 series. Braves out in front, 2-1 to one here in the sixth inning, one away. And here's Javier Lopez. And the Yankees winning their game tonight on a home run by Bernie Williams. You talk about a guy who's had a, a marvelous season and a terrific postseason first against Texas and a game winner tonight it's amazing that a player with the ability of Bernie Williams can play in the city like New York the size of New York and still be relatively unknown yeah he's a young player you don't hear yeah. anybody talk about him on a national level he's one of the best young players in baseball he had a great division series against Texas and he's right back at it in the ALCS. Two and two on Lopez. Well, that's the one thing postseason play will do. It will launch you into prominence when you do well and just the opposite when you do poorly. Well, there was a shot of a guy there that got on the wrong train today when he got on the wrong ahead. subway, right? Yes, so. <laughs> Marta brought him to Fulton County Stadium. 2-2 <laughs> to Lopez. That'll get out of play again. Very strong start for Andy Bennis. That's the good news. The bad news for Bennis and the Cardinals. He's matched up with John Smoltz, who has been even better. Allowing only one run on two hits. The only Cardinal run has come home on a wild pitch. Two to Lopez. Will that stay playable for Jordan? Yep. Two up. Well, tomorrow is game two of the National League Championship Series. When Brian Jordan and the St. Louis Cardinals saw Brian Jordan make that catch. They face off against Greg Maddox and the world champion Atlanta Braves. The road to the World Series on Fox continues beginning at 8 Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific tomorrow. Die reaching for a pitch, strike one. Hey, it's Joe. For power pitchers, the hitters will tell a pitching coach whether a pitcher still has good stuff by the outs, the types of outs that they make. This inning, Klesko, fly ball the other way, same as Lopez. Die into left field, and it will die into the glove of Ron Gant. Inning over. So with the score, Atlanta 2, St. Louis 1. We'll be back to Fulton County after this from your local station. There's the first pitch of the seventh inning, a little high for ball one to Gary Gaetti. Two to one, the Braves out in front, only two hits for the Cardinals. Nothing surprising with the kind of pitching Atlanta throws at you. A little blue base hit into center field. And a good start for the Cardinals here in the seventh. Gaetti breaks his bat. He's on to start the seventh inning. Nice, and quick, and easy reset. Jordan a triple. Leading off in the second inning. Scored in a wild pitch. Lemke, the two-run hit in the fifth inning. Chipper Jones has had a good night. First night of the National League Championship Series. John Smoltz, an LCS record, six tonight, but 52 career strikeouts in the LCS. That's the record. Andy Bennett, seven strikeouts, but matched up with Smoltz and Atlanta. 
with Jim McCarver and Bob Friendly. I'm Joe Buck, and we have a pinch runner, Miguel Mejia. He takes over for Gary Gaetti. So this tells you what Tony La Russa thinks of not only the way Andy Venice is pitching, but the way John Smoltz is pitching. You're not going to get many opportunities. Mejia can absolutely fly. Mabry looks at ball one. Mejia was a Rule 5 pickup out of the Oriole organization. Turned 21 during the season, had only two hits, but made his presence felt on this Cardinal team by pinch running and stealing important bases. He played in 45 games, 26 of those games as a pinch runner. He's running, Mabry a base hit to center, and Mejia will head to third. So back-to-back -back hits by Gaetti and Mabry. Mejia the tying run at third, and Bobby Cox of the Braves in seventh inning trouble. The base hit by Mabry, his first of the night. Watch how John Mabry not only waited on the breaking ball, but really went down and got that breaking ball on the hit and run. Tony LaRusso is telling us before the game that that would be his option instead of the straight steal or the sacrifice with the runner on at first. His primary option would be the hit and run. And a good job of base running by Mejia. He doesn't go for the fake here by the middle infielders. You'll see them try to bluff him into believing this is a ground ball double play. But he is not buying it at all. Good base running. He picked up that ball right away. Advances the third base easily. Does not go for the fake by Jeff Lauser. So Mabry, by far the key hit in this game for St. Louis, sending the tying run over to third on the hit and run. And now Pagnazzi digs in. Runners at the corners. Nobody out. Braves leading by one. Lays off the splitter ball one. On the infield, the Braves lay back, except at third. 2-0 on Pagnazzi. Up the middle, they will go for the double play or the putout and give the tying run here in the seventh inning. That's why this is not a running situation because on a double play ball, you're going to score a run. If you have a runner thrown out on a swing and a miss on a hit and run play, There's a, there's a good example, Tim, of how hard Smoltz is throwing. It's 2-0 and on Pagnazzi, looking fastball, and he mm -hmm. still couldn't catch up. Still going the other way with the foul ball. If you get a runner thrown out, then you have a man on third. It's easier for the Braves to work themselves out of the inning. Right now, double play ground ball scores a run. 2-1, to one, Atlanta out in front, and Smoltz wants to think about it. Yeah, particularly with the bottom of the order coming up for the Cardinals. Luis Alisea on deck and then Andy Bennis, although the Cardinals do have bullpen activity, shouldn't get down to Bennis' spot. And a right center field, falling in a hurry, a base hit. The tying run, Mejia will score. Mabry, the lead run down to second. Three straight singles, and the Cardinals have tied it here in the seventh. And Pagnazzi drives in his third run of the postseason. Well, you really have to credit Tony La Russa. He pulled the right string. He got the leadoff hit from Gaetti. He puts Mabry into a hit and run situation as Mejia is taking off from first. And that leads directly to a run. That hit by Mabry, the biggest hit in this ball game so far because it's setting up a multiple run inning for the Cardinals. Bob, we've talked about it all year. When you get the first two hitters on base in an inning, so often that third hitter tells you whether it's going to be a one-run inning, something small, or something bigger. And now as Pagnazzi dumps a base hit into right field, the Cardinals have to be thinking about taking a seventh inning lead. Well, absolutely. You're talking about the possibility of a, a double play ground ball and one run scoring, and you have two outs and really nothing going in the inning. But by getting one more base hit, it really opens up a lot of possibilities here for the Cardinals. Well, the Cardinals almost have to bunt right here with Alisea. Almost guaranteed. 
<laughs> and he pops it up into left. So they don't bunt. And Alisson is the first down here in the seventh inning. Well, Tony LaRusso, the reason we were talking about that, Tony, before the game, said, with a man on second base and nobody out, even in the early inning, I'd be more apt to bunt. And here with his eight-hole hitter, he ends up swinging away, trying to cross the Braves' defense up. Alisaia gets under it, pops it up, a big out for Smoltz. Yeah, to me, he's got a bunt in that situation. I mean, to me, that's a clear-cut situation of an eight-hole hitter having to bunt. That's the way I look at it. Well, there's a reason why a guy's hitting in that eighth hole. I mean, if he was uh, the kind of guy that you counted on to produce runs and drive the ball into the gap, he'd be hitting higher in the order. Now McGee will come off the bench. What a career he has had. Of course, as we talk about this being a rematch of sorts, same NLCS there was in 1982. 1982 was McGee's coming out party. Especially in that World Series against Milwaukee. Two on, one out, and McGee hits it to left for Klesko. A couple of big outs picked up by Smoltz. Two out here in the seventh. Yeah, and by not bunting, the fly ball produces nothing. Right. And a little over-aggressiveness, perhaps, on the part of the last two hitters. Uh, they've got Smoltz as near on the ropes as you're ever going to have, John Smoltz. And a couple of first-pitch hacks, and suddenly he finds himself with two outs here. And Ozzie Smith at the top of the order coming up. Now two on, two out for Ozzie. Smith looks at strike one, and Smoltz is recharged. One run home, a tie game, and a one ball, one strike count on Smith. Here's a situation, if you're the runner, as you see Petkajic warming for the Cardinals, he be, he'll be the pitcher in the bottom of the seventh. But if you're the runner on at second base, you have to take an extra big lead. John Mabry doesn't have great speed, he's a pretty good runner, but your outfield is not playing Smith very deep. Ozzie does not have a lot of power from the left side. So Mabry will make sure that he get a, gets a good jump from second base. There's a strike and it's one and two. And this crowd wants the seventh inning or at least the top half to end right now. Gets away, and the runners advance to second and third. It's another wild pitch from Smoltz, his second of the night. During the regular season, Smoltz threw 10 wild pitches. Well, this is a wild pitch because the ball was in the dirt, but that's a pitch that Javi Lopez needs to block. He knew it was a split-finger fastball, a pitch that traditionally dives down as it approaches the plate. Just didn't get himself into good position to keep that ball in front. Now the 2-2 two -two to Ozzie Smith. Off the plate, tough play, Blouser. Got it. And the inning is over. The game stays tied. The Cardinals get three hits. Only one run. Time to stretch. Tied at two. Oh, Jack. Bottom of the seventh inning. The Cardinals have tied the game. They were thinking about more in the top of this seventh inning. They burned a pinch runner, Mejia. He came around to score. They need a new third baseman. It's Mike Gallego. And taking over on the mound after Bennis went six strong innings. It's the right-hander, Mark Benkaisic. He takes over and will work to Blouser. Then Smoltz. Then Grissom. Benkaisic with some pretty impressive numbers right there for the Cardinals this season. He throws a power sinker and a hard slider. The kind of pitcher that's hard to get the ball in the air against should he keep it down in the strike zone. 11 wins for Pekaisic, who predominantly worked out of the bullpen. Blouser, who is one out of two, 
started that two-run rally in the fifth inning with a single with one out, leads it off, and took strike one. Into right field, the Cardinals had Blouser played perfectly. So one away, and Smoltz will bat with the bases empty. Well, when you were a kid, there was always one house in the neighborhood your parents wanted you to stay away from. Now you'll find out why, because your first step inside this house could be your last. Don't miss a brand new X-Files Friday, 9 Eastern, 8 Central on Fox. That'd be perfect with Halloween coming up, right? I kind of think they coordinated the two, or if they didn't, it makes sense. It makes sense and was a heck of a coincidence. Out of play, off to the right, off the bat of Smoltz. Tony Foss is getting ready in case this inning for Atlanta becomes a big inning. But right now, it's Ben Kaisek's frame. Smoltz 0 for 2 with a couple of strikeouts. Caught the inside corner, strike 2. Ben Kaisek made only six starts during the regular season but had those 11 wins he had that vulture hanging over his locker time and time again two and two swooped down and sucked up a win right the 11 of them well you could be sure there were starting pitchers on that staff that reminded him of that regularly but one way to look at it is a Pet Kaisek win is a loss that the starter did not <laughs> get hung on him. That's right. One out, nobody on. Just missed inside. Full count on Smoltz. There's Dennis Eckersley. Had three saves in the divisional playoffs. Smoltz strikes out. And Pet Kaisek appearing in his first postseason. Does not appear shaky. Is definitely unfazed by the pressure of coming in, following Andy Bennis, and you can't quarrel with anything Bennis did here tonight. Now, Tony LaRusso has got to be overjoyed with the job Andy Bennis did. Kept the team in the ball game, with the exception of the one inning. He was outstanding, overpowered. Here's Grissom. He had that double off the glove of Ozzie Smith his last time up. He looks at a strike. It was a two-out hit that extended the inning, and then Lemke gets the base hit to drive home the only two Atlanta runs of the night. Oh, and two on Grissom. Pet Kaisek's got the kind of sinkers that will bruise a catcher's thumb. Catcher normally tries to catch the ball with your fingers and your thumb pointed up, but when that sinker starts to go down and you tend to follow it with your glove, that thumb ends up on the bottom, and that's right where that sinker's going to hit on that catcher's mitt. Nothing and two on Grissom. Inning over. Good pitching here tonight. You expected it from Atlanta. The Cardinals getting every bit as good of pitching after seven Tied at two. Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, Bob Brenlin. The 2-2. Two -two. The 2-2 two -two game. <laughs> Good game. First game of the National League Championship Series. How evenly matched so far, guys. The two, three, and four hitters will hit for each side here in the eighth inning. Here's Langford leading it off. Only one hit in the postseason. Only five at-bats. Into left field, easy for Klesko. One out in the eighth. And again, an indication that John Spoltz, the power pitcher, is still throwing very hard because a lot of the outs are being made to the opposite field. Cardinals still can't get around on the Smoltz fastball. Here's Gantz. Ron 0 for 3. Langford 0 for 4. And a strike from Smoltz. You know, Bobby Cox could have very easily have taken Smoltz out in the bottom of the seventh inning, batting second in the inning. He leaves him in. 
I mean, how much better are you going to get on the mound the way Smoltz is throwing the count one and one? And he'd rather take his chances with Smoltz on the mound and let the top of his lineup do something in the eighth inning than get rid of Smoltz in the seventh. Well, even though he had a rocky seventh inning, a lot of times that will be an emotional swing to the other dugout when you take a starter out who's been this dominating. No matter who you bring in to follow him, it's got to be better than what we've been seeing all night because we haven't had a lot of luck against John Smoltz. Ball and two strikes on Gant. Still one and two. Gant in the division series at 400. With one home run, four driven in. Last year in the NLCS for Cincinnati against Atlanta. Hit only 188 with no extra bases. Gant pops it up. Grissom. Two up. It looked like that was going to be trouble coming off the bat of Ronnie Gant. But we mentioned it earlier. Grissom plays a shallow center field. Got to that ball quite easy. Brian Jordan likes the ball away. Those blue areas up and in. He is vulnerable up and in. But if you miss there, that's his power alley. That's why Smoltz went away. Normally, with ex-football players, they are so muscle-bound through the shoulders and, and upper body you can almost always get inside on guys who have been formerly football players. That's why Jordan likes the ball away. Gets it away, shoots it away into right center for Grissom. And a very easy one, two, three, eight inning for Smoltz. Took care of Langford, Gant, and Jordan. Braves bat, bottom of the eighth, tied at two. Fox Sports coverage of Major League Baseball's National League Championship Series is brought to you by Nissan, who reminds you that life is a journey. Enjoy the ride. By Denerex, the serious dandruff champ. By Boston Market, carving out a better sandwich. And by the Oral-B plaque remover, providing unsurpassed clinical performance. The Atlanta Braves will have the two, three, and four hitters bat in the bottom of the eighth inning. We're tied 2-2. Ben Kaisek had a 1-2-3 seventh inning. His first inning of relief help for Andy Benison. Here's Lemke. He has the biggest hit so far for Atlanta. A two-out, two-run single. He came back in the fifth inning. The high delivery from Benis. The base hit into right center. And both Grissom and Blouser scored to make it 2-1 to one at the time. The Cardinals got three straight hits to start their seventh inning but got only one run on an RBI base hit by Pagnazzi to tie it. Two and one on Lemke leading off. T.J. Matthews, the right-hander, getting ready for St. Louis. Tony Fosses is the lefty with an eye on Chipper Jones, McGriff, and Klesko. Three and one on Lemke. And Joe, it's funny about the twists and turns. Mark Wohler's up for the Braves. The twists and turns of the game but had that ball not been deflected by Ozzie Smith, the Braves would have had runners on first and second instead of second and third, and possibly scored one run in that inning instead of two. Lemke draws a leadoff walk in the eighth. In the fifth inning, with two outs, that was the play that Ozzie Smith made. That was to end the inning earlier. That was not the play that we were talking about. But that was the ball deflected by Ozzie Smith in the inning where Lipke had the base hit to score two runs. Instead of first and second, it was second and third. That set up the hit by Lipke. That was the inning ender and the second on a ball hit by Jermaine Dye. Now one on, nobody out. Chipper Jones bunting. Strike one. Does that surprise you? Does me. Because you're going to get Fred McGriff walk, and then Tony LaRusso is going to bring the left-hander Fossus in to pitch to Klesko, and Bobby Cox is going to have to pitch hit for Ryan Klesko. 
I think Tony La Russa should have bunted the seventh inning with Alisea, but I don't Chipper Jones three for three on the night. This is a, an unusual play. Just low, one ball, one strike. And on that pitch, Jones showing no signs of bunting. Chipper had one sacrifice all year. He's too good a hitter to waste an out right here, even though the Braves figure that with one run, they win the ball game. We're in the eighth, tied 2-2. Two -two. One on, nobody out. He is bunting off the plate. Pet Kaisek throws, nobody covers. Ball gets away, Lemke goes to third. Hey, the bunt surprised the Cardinals so that Alisea wasn't covering first base. Ted Kaisek slips off the mound, the ball off the plate, makes a fine play, but Alisea late in covering. Jones knocks the ball out of his glove. Lemke goes to third. It appeared that Alisea saw Pet Kaisek stumble and slowed down in his path to first base. And as you said, he got there too late. Chipper Jones arrived, knocked the ball loose from the glove. Lemke goes to third base. Now we're going to get Tony Foster. Yep. No error on the play. It's ruled a base hit. A walk and a bunt single. Not typical Atlanta Braves thumping, but they'll take it. McGriff coming up, a chance to put the Braves back on top. Surprised by this bunt. John Mabry, the first baseman, doesn't know whether to charge. He eventually gets down, and Petkajic throwing to Alisea, who is late covering. They changed that to a hit by Chipper Jones, his fourth of the game, and an error on Alisea. And you can see from the way Mabry shuffled off the bag, he came straight down the baseline rather than charging. Mm -hmm. Definitely caught him by surprise. But it started with a leadoff walk. Ben Kaisek gone, it's first and third, nobody out, a pinch runner. Andrew Jones is taken over at third. Here's McGriff facing Foss's ball one. Andrew Jones running for Lemke, who led off the inning with a walk, and there's Chipper Jones. The infield is in, and McGriff can put the Braves back on top here in the eighth. This is a tough play for the runner at third base. Normally, with the infield and double play depth, you as the runner at third have to break home on a ground ball. What you do in this situation is make the infielder think you're going to break and then stay at third. By moving the infield in, they take the double play out. Runner Jones from first steals second without a play. Great play by Jones. Great play. They're playing behind Chipper Jones at first base. He gets a great jump on Tony Foss as this eliminates the double play completely. Now we'll see how Tony Foss chooses to go after Fred McGriff, who is a much better hitter against left-handed pitchers than Klesko. Three and oh. Oh for three tonight for McGriff. Career against Fosses, three out of 20. Terry Pendleton waits on deck. Swinging on three and oh. Got the nastiest slider on a 3-0 count. Tony Fosses can gobble up left-handers. Very, very effective against left-handed hitting. Game one of the 1996 NLCS, second and third, nobody out. McGriff pops it up. A big out for Fawcett and the Cardinals, one down. And McGriff now three out of 21 lifetime against Fawcett. 
Now it's Jerry Pendleton coming up, pinch hitting for Klesko. Tony La Russa may elect to walk Pendleton, bring in the right-hander to face Lopez. You would have to imagine they'll put Pendleton on, load the bases, as you say, bring in T.J. Matthews to deal to Javi Lopez. Could also play his infield back at that point if he chose to, to go for the double play up the middle. Right. Yeah, because if you pitch to Pendleton, you've got to bring the infield in. So by walking Pendleton, you do two things. You set up the double play, and then you have the good matchup right-hander against the right-handed Lopez. And Lopez has grounded into 17 double plays this year, not the swiftest runner on this Braves team. Mm -hmm. What Tony La Russa and Dave Duncan will do is go right to their bullpen now. Allow T.J. Matthews a chance to get acclimated to the surroundings, to the mound. Bosses came on, got the grip. T.J. Matthews now on. Likely the Cardinals will walk Pendleton to load him up and deal with Lopez. We'll find out in just a minute. Wheels are spinning in the eighth inning, tied at two. And T.J. Matthews comes in to intentionally walk Terry Pendleton to load the bases for Javier Lopez. So Tony La Russa goes right to T.J. Matthews. Bob, what do you think? You bring a pitcher in, ask him to throw four out of the strike zone, intentionally walk somebody, then load him up. Now you got to throw strikes. Well, I always personally felt that I would rather have the guy who's leaving the game throw the four balls and then bring this guy in the game knowing he's going to have to be around the strike zone. But... Uh, I guess there's a couple different schools of thought. One is that he gets out there on the mound, gets a chance to, to feel comfortable on the new mound after coming in from the bullpen, but I'd prefer to have a guy come in from the bullpen and be zoned in on the strike zone. Tony La Russa telling his middle infielders to play for two. Javier Lopez, bases loaded one out, a 2-2 game, eighth inning. little high heat. Strike two. And don't think Tony La Russa didn't know that number. We just put up Lopez hitting a buck 20 with the bases loaded. They intentionally walk the pinch hitter Pendleton. Bases loaded, one out, tie game, eighth inning, and it's an 0-2 count on Javi Lopez. Broken bat, base hit! Jones scores! Here comes Chipper, 4-2 Atlanta. A game that has seen pin back broken. The go-ahead hit in the eighth inning on a broken bat up the middle. I'll tell you, there is nothing whatsoever a pitcher can do about that. An 0-2 pitch in on the hand. Lopez strong enough to fight it off up the middle. Three consecutive fastballs by Matthews. The first one up high. He got Lopez to swing and miss. And a called strike down the middle with another fastball. Came back with a good one on the inside part of the plate. But strong hitters will foul off those pitches or put them in play somehow. It seemed like he had Lopez open a couple different ways there. Maybe go back up the ladder with the high fastball again. A breaking ball in the dirt. But chose to go with the hard sinker. And Lopez made it pay. Now first and second, one out for Jermaine Dye. Braves have their biggest lead of the night. Ball one from Matthews. And you know what Atlanta does with a lead going into the ninth inning. They still have Wallers getting ready out in the Atlanta bullpen.
tell you, catchers are trained on 0-2 pitches to try to go off the plate, either tantalize and tease a hitter, make him go after a ball. My thing on that, Bob, is Tom Pagnazzi tried to come inside. The ball was off the plate away. Lopez breaks the bat. Strike two on Jermaine Dye. It can't be everywhere. It was a fastball on an 0-2 count. On the hands away, right in here, off the plate. Tailing inside at a little bit too much of the plate. I guess it was off the plate a bit. But, I mean, a broken bat hit, what are you going to do? Die a good piece of hitting to stay alive, and the count stays one and two. Hey, if you end up throwing a slider and you hang the slider, you're going to second-guess yourself a lot more than the fastball. It went to the right pitch, maybe a little more inside, but I don't think you'd really second-guess that, uh, that pitch by T.J. Matthews there. This inning started with a walk, and then the irony, the bunt base hit by Chipper Jones. Guy strikes out for the second out of the inning. You can charge the two runs in the inning to pick Isaac. And now with two on, two out, the batter will be Jeff Blauser. That's the fastball he wanted to throw to Javi Lopez right mm -hmm. there. A little mm -hmm. bit higher up in the strike zone, tougher to handle right in on the hands. So the Braves have taken the lead here in the eighth inning on a bases loaded two run single by Javier Lopez. Now Blauser looks at ball one. Hey, the story of this game so far, Luis Alisea not bunting with two on and nobody out in the seventh inning and Chipper Jones surprising everybody, including the Cardinals, by bunting in this inning. One ball, one strike on Blauser. He surprised Alisea. He surprised Mabry. Yep. It was a bunt single off the bat of Chipper Jones, then the error. As Alisea, who was late in covering, took the throw, the ball was knocked out of his glove by Chipper Jones. And now with two on, two out, two runs in, Jeff Blauser. Tries to add to the Atlanta lead. Strike two. That was also a big error because now Tony Fontes comes in to pitch to Fred McGriff. And instead of first and second and nobody out, you know McGriff's not going to be bunting. But Atlanta had first and third and nobody out. One, two to Blauser. That's foul. Bowler's getting ready. He will come in and pitch in the ninth inning. They already have a pinch hitter on deck in case the inning continues. Bowler's had a save in each of the three wins in the sweep in the divisional playoff against L.A. Two on, two out, two runs in for Atlanta here in the eighth inning. Got him to end the inning. But an inning for Atlanta in which they scored two runs on two hits. One error. They leave here in the ninth inning. Tim, Bob, and I will award today's Chevrolet player of the game. We get into the ninth inning. Andrew Jones, who pitch ran for Mark Lemke, stays in the game in left field. Now playing second base in place of Lemke is Rafael Belliard. Found is the Atlanta Braves closer. 39 saves during... The regular season, three already in the postseason. It's Mark Wolders. Well, we've seen a lot of great fastballs in this ballgame already tonight from John Smoltz and Andy Bennis. You're going to see a few more good fastballs in this ninth inning because this man can rush it up there upwards to high 90s, occasionally hits 100 on the gun. He will face a pinch hitter to lead off here in the ninth inning. Mark Sweeney will bat for Gallego. Then Mabry, then Pagnazzi. Braves leading 4-2, top of the ninth inning, game one. The National League Championship Series. Sweeney looks at a strike.
by the way, in case you're wondering, Mark Wohlers is indeed batting ninth. Swinney couldn't catch up, strike two from Wohlers, 98 miles per hour. It's an interesting situation. You bring Belliard and Wohlers in the game. The guy you're trying to protect now is Belliard and not Wohlers because Belliard, if he does relinquish the lead, you're going to pinch hit for him in the bottom of the ninth inning anyway. Quickly an 0-2 count on Sweeney leading off in the ninth. Mabry, who has a hit tonight, waits on deck. Got it! One out here in the ninth inning. Now tomorrow, Cal Ripken and the Baltimore Orioles take on Bernie Williams who is the hero tonight in the New York Yankees on NBC, 3 o'clock Eastern time. We'll follow right back here with the Braves and Cardinals, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on Fox, game number two. Here's Mabry, and there's the chopper to Belliard, just into the game, two out. And the Cardinals down to their final out here in game one in Atlanta. like to thank our Fox crew for the great shots, sights and sounds from Fulton County Stadium here tonight. The fan gets loose on the field, so give us a chance to thank our producer, John Filippelli, our director, Bill Webb, Steve Horn in the booth, Lance Garrett, Kathy Hunt, some of the many names we will bring you game one of the 1996 National League Championship Series. You'll find the entire NLCS right here on Fox and then the World Series right here on Fox. I think the Atlanta Braves are a better team this year than they have been the last four years because of this man right here. The last four years, World Championship last year, they were winning their division they won the league, but they were developing a closer. You may remember they tried to get Jeff Reardon. They got Jeff Reardon in 92. He gave up the home run to Ed Sprague in game two. Mark Wohlers does not cough up too many leads, and he is becoming one of the dominant closers in the game. And that's why the Braves are better, I think, this year than in past years. Two out, nobody on. Strike one to Pagnazzi. innings allowing two runs on five hits. Bobby Cox has turned it over to Wolters. Two up, two down, and a one-two count on Pagnazzi. Game one belongs to Atlanta. Three ninth inning for Mark Wolders. Our Chevrolet player of the game, Javier Lopez. The 0-2 pitch, the broken bat single into center with the bases loaded. 
to make it a 4-2 game, and that's the way it ended. Steve Lyons will be back on the other side of the break with an interview after Javier Lopez in the eighth inning. Little chip came out of that bat. Two runs across the plate. Smoltz and the Braves are winners. They take game one in Atlanta. Back to wrap it up in Fulton County in a minute. 